welcome. Uh, welcome to this first dialogue uh, that uh, us at ELIA, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, we are organizing jointly with uh, the CIIE.co, the Innovation Continuum, a center of excellence set at the India Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, with the support of uh, the Government of India's Department of Science and Technology and the Government of Gujarat. I am Julia Emone Marsan, Area Director for Strategy and Partnership, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, this is the first dialogue. It will be, it's the first of a cycle of four online events with the aim to compare, share, and learn from experiences across both India and ASEAN. In a nutshell, we want to facilitate peer learning and exchanges of good practices. India and ASEAN are large, very dynamic regions in Asia and also globally. And these dynamisms also means that we are witnessing the emergence of very interesting innovation practices, ecosystems, as well as the consolidation of more matured ones. And what I think is also very interesting is that we are seeing uh, emerging different paths to innovation and entrepreneurship compared to what we observe typically in the West. This is why we have today uh, a great group of speakers from both India and ASEAN, uh, in ASEAN from the Philippines and Singapore uh, in particular. Uh, and we are going to discuss about uh, incubation, acceleration of uh, innovation, new ventures, uh, new ideas, uh, entrepreneurship. And also about what governments can do to support this process in general and also in the context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Now, before starting introducing our speakers, let me remind you to all of you to please keep your microphone on mute during the entire duration of the webinar. Uh, but please feel free to interact with us. We have a chat box. Use it to ask questions uh, uh, to the speakers because we will get back to your, Q, to your questions during the Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. But now, time to introduce the speaker, and we are very glad to have with us Mr. Mudit Narain, who is the Chief Technology Officer in the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Uh, Mudit holds two master's degrees in engineering and public policy from the MIT, and an undergraduate degree in civil and environmental engineering. He served in the energy practice of the World Bank for seven years, working on projects across nine countries in three continents. And in India has also worked in many leading organizations uh, to establish multiple national schemes to support innovation and entrepreneurship in the country. His interests include energy, climate change, innovation for development, entrepreneurship, and policy. Welcome and thank you for being with us, Mudit. We are also very happy to have uh, in the, on the panel, Ms. Michelle Eng. She's senior associate at Quest Ventures a top venture capital fund in Asia. She works closely with startups to accelerate their growth through a combination of incubation services and programs. And she's also responsible for key markets in Southeast Asia and emerging Asia. And prior to this, she was responsible for international startup ecosystem networks at the Action Community for Entrepreneurship, which is Singapore's national entrepreneurship ecosystem builder where she engaged startup communities in North Asia and Southeast Asia with market access and regional innovation initiatives. Michelle is also involved in uh, uh, various organizations like the People Association Youth Network of Singapore, a grassroots organization for community engagement, and uh, Social Impact Catalyst, the largest non-profit organization for young social entrepreneurs in Singapore. Thank you, Michelle. Also with us today, Dr. Chintan Vaishnav, uh, he's Mission Director at Atal Innovation Mission. He's a socio technologist and engineer trained to design and build large scale systems that process both human as well as technological complexities. He serves as the Mission Director for Atal Innovation Mission, a flagship initiative of the Government of India, and we will hear more about this uh, in a few minutes. And as a teacher, innovator, and entrepreneur, he has split his time between teaching and research at the MIT and living and working with rural communities in India to build solutions that can overcome constraints fundamental to improving human conditions. 
thank you very much, Chintan, for being with us. Also on the panel, uh, Miss Melnava, she's the CEO of One Export, a company based in the Philippines. She founded One Export in 2016. It is an online platform that allows small and medium businesses to become compliant with international requirements and find buyers so they can successfully sell to international markets. She currently serves more than 3,500 MSMEs and 10 farming communities, and they export products to over 200 stores in many different countries worldwide. Mel has participated in several startup competitions since 2015, winning seed grants in both the Idea Space Foundation in the Philippines and Sugal Pitch in the US. And she holds an MBA in business administration and also degrees in psychology. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mel. And finally, last but certainly not least, Mr. Chintan Bakshi, uh, who is partner at the CIIE.co, uh, India leading startup incubation center. Chintan brings a unique experience of uh, uh, starting uh, scaling social enterprises and tech startup companies, primarily in the rural and bottom of the pyramid space. Uh, he has six years of project management experience in companies like Feedback Ventures, Maruki Suzuki, the Tash Group, and also uh, 19 years of startup founder and startup incubation experience. He has co-founded two startups in the past uh, in electronic procurement platform and also mobile enabled rural distribution startup. And he joined the CAE.co in 2013 to lead the incubation vertical of the organization in Jaipur. Chintan is an engineering graduate from the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And he's passionate about uh, the adoption of experiential alternative education systems and survival of Indic and indige indigenous knowledge and spiritual traditions for the benefit of Indian youth and posteriority. How interesting and we are so curious to learn more. Uh, I would like to stay with Chintan uh, Bakshi now for the first round uh, of questions. And uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Chintan uh, to uh, maybe make a couple of introductory remarks, but also give us an overview of the current landscape of the Indian incubator ecosystem and also its salient features. And also what are the major turning points in the development of the Indian incubator ecosystem that uh, you would like to share with us? Over to you, Chintan Bakshi. Thank you, Julia. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so I'll just start with a quick introduction uh, to CI Co, uh, and then then uh, uh, get into the questions that you ask. So CI Co is the incubation center at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, uh, and uh, we were set up as a as a separate entity in two thousand eight. Uh, and have been doing various uh, programs to support startups across the spectrum. In fact, we call, call ourselves the innovation continu continuum now uh, for the reason that we are, uh, over the last few years, we have been able to cover almost the entire continuum of innovation, uh, right from working at, at very grassroots regional levels uh, by partnering with uh, regional partners, uh, and that's the uh, that's the uh, vertical within CIO that I take care of. Uh, so the incubation vertical, where we work with state governments, local partners, and work with very early stage uh, entrepreneurs. We have done work in Gujarat, Rajasthan. We are doing something in Assam, uh, various Indian states. Uh, then we also have, uh, you know, going to the next level, we have. Uh, acceleration and seed funding. Uh, so when a startup essentially moves up and is now ready to scale up, uh, so we have a separate team which does acceleration and seed funding. We also have now separate funds to, to help startups in the growth and the scale up stage, right? series A funds. And finally, we have uh, you know a separate vertical covering insights research because there's so much coming up in the startup and incubation uh, space in terms of new learnings, academic frameworks, experiences, et cetera. So we have a team which looks into that and publishes reports and insights and findings uh, in various sectors, but largely focused on the startup ecosystem. So that's a quick snapshot of CI Co. Uh, I think your question was basically some sort of a landscape of the incubator ecosystem and, and what have been the key highlights uh, so in a in a way, I have been involved with the 
uh, with the startup slash incubator ecosystem for the last 19 years, as you mentioned in, in my introduction. Uh, and in a, in a, and you know, uh, just by chance, it kind of coincides with the way the <clears throat> incubation ecosystem has, has kind of evolved in India. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, maybe early 2000s was the time when, uh, you know, the Department of Science and Technology actually, I mean, they were uh, the, the front runners uh, am amongst the government institutions to basically lead the uh, process of developing the incubator ecosystem. So I think around, uh, in fact, I remember uh, a conference in 2004 or 2005 uh, when all these uh, discussions were done as to what the shape and form of incubators should be in the Indian context. And at that point of time, it was really looking at commercializing research in, uh, in, uh, in technology institutions, in R&D institutions. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, we probably did not have startups as the, perhaps not even as a term at that point of time, while the internet 1.0 had started happening and there were a few startups which had emerged. But I mean, the focus of the incubation ecosystem at that point of time was uh, trying to figure out how to commercialize uh, research. Uh, and therefore, the first few incubators that got set up around that time uh, were essentially in research institutions, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Technology, uh, you know, across, across the country. Uh, and, you know, that, that's the way it continued, I would say, for the next few years. And, you know, then we had the internet 2.0 sort of way where we had the next stage of uh, internet startups coming up, you know, e-commerce, consumer, consumer internet, maybe that was around 2008, 9, 10. Uh, I would say that's really one of the key turning points of the, of the incubation ecosystem when, uh, you know, the, while the incubators were being set up, uh, but the, the kind of successes that we were seeing were far and few because this was really focused on, uh, you know, uh, research, trying to commercialize it. I mean, that that is something that has a very long lead time. Uh, but 2008, 9, 10, somewhere around that time, we also started getting, uh, you know, these more nimble startups, which were trying to uh, build uh, leaner products, which could be, which could be taken to market fairly fast. Uh, and they started uh, kind of interfacing with the incubation centers probably the government also realized that there is uh, there is there is need to support more incubation centers so i think that is probably the second phase where there was a significant growth uh, in the number of incubation centers uh, and going beyond commercializing research looking at uh, tech startups in the in the internet space uh, etc uh, you know we also had a few quite a few successes uh, i mean startups raising multiple rounds of funding you know flipkart was one of the one of the first ones which which kind of went fairly large uh, so i think that triggered the ecosystem and it had a kind of a virtuous effect on the on the incubation ecosystem too uh, so i would say that the other key important milestone and you know uh, chintan and mudit in fact both have a uh, significant uh, experience chintan is of course leading atal innovation mission uh, which was probably the third phase when uh, so while this time, I mean, the focus of the incubation ecosystem was largely on, on technology, right? I would also like, like to mention is that, that perhaps around 2015, 16 was also the time when the state governments in India uh, started looking at incubation as a way of uh, sort of economic development, job uh, employment creation, et cetera. So quite a few state governments started getting interested. I mean, there were two or three which were early movers, Kerala, uh, Karnataka, Rajasthan to some extent, Gujarat, I mean, these three, four, and that's the time when, so maybe that's also an important milestone that state government started getting very interested and almost started competing with, with each other in terms of uh, kind of coming up with policies, etc. Uh, and 2016, if I'm not mistaken, was also the time when the, uh, the central government came up, came up with the uh, startup policy. Uh, and that was also the time, I think, more or less the same time when the Atal Innovation Mission uh, was, was set up, uh, maybe a couple of years before that. Uh, and they started broad basing, uh, I think, the incubation ecosystem. They started looking at uh, even supporting uh, private organizations, uh, which, which had a, uh, an incubator-like setup, which could spawn startups. They started looking at non-technology-based uh, uh, startups. So, you know, that was probably the other 
significant uh, development and a significant milestone. Uh, now, of course, I think uh, you know there are probably more than 200, 250 uh, registered incubators in India, uh, supported by various uh, organizations. Uh, I mean, now the, now the talk is really to look at incubators specializing and maybe even super specializing in subsectors, uh, right? Rather than just being a one size fits all and, and a very generalized incubator. So focusing on sectors, there are now incubators which focus on women entrepreneurs, uh, which focus on specific uh, agri-tech subsectors, sub uh, focus on specific technologies, which is really the mark of a more mature uh, ecosystem uh, coming up. Uh, you are, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll kind of uh, leave it at that, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, map the, the development of the incubator ecosystem and, and, as you mentioned, to highlight some of the key important milestones. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Shinta. That was extremely interesting, I think. Uh, now I would like to move uh, uh, to another country, to Michelle, uh, uh, who's now in Singapore. Uh, and I will ask you a similar question, actually. What trends have you been observing in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem emergence across Southeast Asia, uh, given your multi-country experience? Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Viola. Um, I think in terms of the trends that we are observing in uh, the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem um, in Southeast Asia, I think one thing will come to mind definitely is that it's maturing as an innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, I think our friends at Golden Gate Ventures did predict a record number of exits that will happen in the region over the next couple of years. So I, I would think that it will be Contrib the contributing factors would be a maturing uh, ecosystem, more secondary buyers and the emergence of specs that helps uh, startups exit. So it is ex estimated that there's going to be about 700 plus exits between 2023 to 2025. So mainly going to be through um, the mergers and acquisitions, but also IPOs um, through the special uh, purpose acquisition company called SPEC. Uh, you'll probably be very familiar with um, Grab. I think uh, it's all over the news that Grab is um, going to be listed. Uh, and I think it's true a spec uh, with Altimeter Growth Corp. Then the valuation is out of, uh, I think it's really mind blowing. It's about a USD 40 billion valuation. And that's not the only company in Southeast Asia that is going to exit. So you would see uh, Gojek and Tokopedia in Indonesia. And there's also a Singapore company called Carousel that's considering to list um, at the end of 2021 uh, via a spec as well. So when you see this number of exits you, and seeing that it's relatively young and ecosystem, you could tell that Southeast Asia is tending towards uh, maturing as a, as a startup ecosystem. We have spent like about five to 10 years growing um, this whole ecosystem. And despite being very different in terms of the stage of developments, we do see that there are opportunities for exit um, in, in the different countries, including Singapore, Indonesia, and um, also other other countries in Southeast Asia. Then you could also see that it's maturing when there are more startups being founded and funded. So you tell you can tell that the early employees from the mature companies, the mature startups, they are often um, joining like after after they exit the company, they actually uh, start new businesses uh, themselves. And you would see that there's a significant number of alumni from Grab, Gojek and Lazada starting their own company. And that contributes to a more vibrant ecosystem in, in Southeast Asia. And because they are very familiar about how startups are, are work, how fundraising works and how startup growth works. So you would see that um, they are very uh, well-versed when they go pitch to investors um, and also grow their companies um, in the region. So that's one thing that we do see um, in Southeast Asia. And also you would see that there is more venture capital and resources that are available for setup uh, in Southeast Asia. So uh, in, because of the maturing ecosystem in Southeast Asia, there are more capital and resources poured into this part of the world. Uh, in quarter one of 2021 this year, so there were about 6 billion uh, worth of funding towards startups. 
And this is based on uh, reports from Deal Street Asia, PwC, and Genesis Ventures. So of course it takes more than capital to make a startup and innovation ecosystem work. Apart from capital, Quest does build an ecosystem for the Quest family. And we work very closely to help our companies grow and raise their next round of funding. So you would see that ecosystem building uh, around our portfolio and also within the region is very important. So you, you can tell that um, from the support that we provide, basically the family benefit that helps our startups have cost savings of um, about USD 770,000 and also mentorship programs, accelerator programs, incubators um, to help our startups grow and raise their next round. I think um, just recently, we did a Quest Ventures Day where um, over 500 international investors join us to hear a study of our portfolio companies pitch. I think that's something that um, you could see more uh, investors do for their startups to help them go and, and also uh, raise their next round of funding. So that's it from me and back to you, Julia. Thank you very much, Michelle. So uh, lots of dynamisms, both in Southeast Asia and in India. Uh, we're not surprised, we knew it already. Uh, but now I would like maybe to go uh, back to India uh, with Mudit uh, to talk a little bit about uh, policy support. Uh, what can you tell us about the evolution of uh, policy support for incubators in India? And also a little bit about the major impact metrics that governments can use to evaluate the success of an incubator. Uh, over to you, Moody. Mudit, you are muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi. So um, let me take the first question in a bit. About, and I'll come to it, which is the, but let me first come to what the metrics are. So when we look at the metrics as a program, which is running incubators, the government is looking to establish a culture of starting up on your own, finding business niches, creating business models that can be sold. And a good incubator should be able to support startups at the entire stage of input, output, outcome, and impact. And for a government which is working with mostly academic institutes, but also sometimes think tanks or industry associations, SME associations, the input output uh, metrics tend to be both money as well as the number of uh, startups that are incubated. But I believe that one important metric, and especially in a city where you're getting things going, is the number of outreach events or programs that you're doing to train incubators. And now let me connect this to the question of the evolution of um, incubation in the country. So as Chintan earlier said, the entire incubation exercise or the incubation programs in the country are about 15 to 20 years old. Maybe there are a couple of incubators which are a little older, but till about 10 years ago, nobody in the government knew what the word incubator is outside a medical context. And it is only now in the last five to seven years, maybe the last eight years that people have started to understand that incubation is a way of supporting a startup from, become, from an idea to becoming an enterprise. And for that, the entire process of giving some technical support, some financial support, some engagement with the industry is required. And that evolution has started from one or two individuals who spoke about this idea and who were doing it basically of their own initiative, pushing the boundaries of what government was doing and pushing the boundaries of what the society at that time was expecting to the time now where it has become almost like a revolution. I, I know there are eight ministries in the country which have incubation programs of various kinds, right from the Department of Science and Technology, which started it off, to the Atal Innovation Mission, to Department of Medium and Small Indust Industries, MSMEs, Agriculture, eight ministries do it. So that entire evolution only got built up because Department of Science and Technology looked at metrics and evaluation of programs across this chain. Because only when there is good evidence that this kind of a program can be delivered will other ministries take it up. So this evolution has been fairly, I mean, I would say it, it made haste slowly. For the first 10 odd years, there was fairly few incubators set up and then it took off very quickly 
because the metrics got established very cleanly and which were able to inspire confidence in a lot of other ministries and other departments to take this up. And that metrics, I think at this point are an established science, are a good way of seeing which, which uh, initiatives are working and which are not. So it's, it's able to see where the ecosystem works, where the individuals are aligned with the uh, uh, mission, as well as if the, the right uh, location and the right uh, ecosystem were found. So that's how governments would like to support innovation. And that's how this evolution has happened in the country. Thank you very much, Mudit, uh, also for highlighting how many different sectors of the Indian government are working together uh, with this uh, same aim. Horizontal collaboration is absolutely necessary when you're talking about uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems. Now, I would like to stay in India and now, I mean, uh, go and uh, um, take the point of view from Shintan Vaishnav. Uh, could you please, briefly please introduce for us uh, Atal Innovation Missions, uh, several goals and initiatives, and also how is it different from other policies in India? Over to you, Chintan. Thank you. There are not too many panels in the world where you will have two Chintans simultaneously. I can guarantee you that. But it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me add to what uh, Chintan and Mudit already said. So, so one way to, so if you step back, so Atal Innovation Missions, um, um, uh, objective is to uh, create a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship across the length and breadth of the nation. That's sort of the stated objective. You step back from it, ask a question, uh, what is this really trying to do? So essentially what you're trying to do is that there is a lot of creative potential on one side. Anybody who's been to India would endorse this. Um, and uh, you, you're trying to put a transducer of a sort where creative ideas come in and innovation and entrepreneurship goes out, right? So that, uh, that uh, transducer is that innovation ecosystem, if you would. Um, um, and uh, Artel Innovation Mission is one such transducer. So uh, it, it has five programs. Um, uh, 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 Atal Tinkering Labs, which is in the schools, uh, about 7,500 of them, where there are maker spaces uh, to teach people from idea to some kind of a, uh, you know, an artifact and then application of that artifact. Um, uh, Atal Incubation Center, which is at universities and industry bodies and so on. Uh, Atal Community Incubation Centers, which is incubation, but with more of community institutions and civil society organizations and so on. And then there are two other programs which are kind of challenges where uh, one program, Atal New India Challenge, where ministries submit national problem statements and we link solutions to those problem statements. Uh, another one where MSME is the micro, small and medium scale industries submit problem statements and we link solutions to the problem statements. Now, I think you rightly asked the question that, you know, what is unique about Atul Innovation Mission? Uh, so, of course, the precursor to that question is that why should eight different agencies do it, uh, do this work? Is it reasonable for them to do it that way? I think the answer right now is yes, it's okay for eight, eight of them to do it because uh, uh, each of them have a very specialized role. So a biotechnology incubator is different from an agriculture incubator, as, as Chintan was saying, uh, that this is a sign of maturing towards a, a better uh, ecosystem. Um, so so Atal Innovation Mission in particular is, is doing two things that are unique. And I think both go to, again, Chintan's point about the broad basing of the innovation ecosystem. One is we are the only program that touches the school children. So these 7,500 schools that we have a, a maker space in uh, or tinkering lab in, uh, the, the, these, this is the earliest stage at which somebody is thinking about an enterprise. I fully well expect that in some years you will see school children who earned far more than their, their parents ever did because it will decouple this sequential notion of thou shall study first and then work. You know, you can do both of them, 
in parallel. So I think that's one unique piece. The other piece that's unique about Atul Innovation Mission is that because it sits in Niti Aayog, which is a central think tank, um, it has the possibility of cutting across ministries to work on ideas that require a lot of interdisciplinarity. You use the word horizontal, the same idea. Uh, and so that I think that's again very unique about Atul Innovation Mission. Back to you. Thank you very much for this brief but very uh, insightful introduction. Uh, now I would like to uh, go to the last speakers of the, this first round of questions to Mel in the Philippines. Uh, and I would like to get your point of view as an entrepreneur and startup. So can you please uh, uh, give us an idea of uh, and also your opinion about the evolving innovation landscape in the Philippines, but also more broadly in Southeast Asia? Over to you, Mel. Okay, so thank you, Julia, for your question. Um, just to, so maybe to give more context, uh, of course, Michelle kind of touched on this uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but, but however, in the Philippines, um, you know, the landscape is uh, fairly different, right? In the Philippines, we don't really have a lot of unicorns. Uh, in fact, I don't think we have any unicorn in the Philippines. And, and that sort of puts us in a position where um, in terms of landscape, right, uh, startups in the Philippines are more problem focused, right? Because they don't have a lot of funding, right? And funding is not readily available, especially if, if funding is not available for startups in the city areas, it's it's uh, more so in the rural areas or in the provinces where, you know, you try to put in or instill innovation with your students. However, um, you know, they're not, they don't have the access or, or, or funding to do so. So I guess um, how, how the landscape has changed was back in 2015, you, you really had to sort of had, have this tech product or have, you know, tech be tech enabled, right? So normally investors will not invest in you if you do not have any tech integration or whatnot. But right now, especially in the likes of, um, say, uh, you have uh, WeWork uh, falling down or Theranos falling down, um, a lot of the uh, requirements now for startups, uh, especially in, uh, in the in developing countries like the Philippines is uh, sustainability, profitability, and making sure that you know you are alive, right? And so, how do you or how are you able to solve big problems without spending a lot? And and so in the Philippines, that's sort of how um, people have developed. Uh, we've we've seen um, startups in the rural areas that have survived, um, you know, and 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 have thrived over bigger brands in Southeast Asia because they are problem focused. They're pro they're focused on localization, um, and they're also focused on providing value to their customers. And so that's sort of how it's been. Um, uh, especially in uh, the Philippines or, or more developing countries where you don't really have a lot of funding, but you do have a lot of innovation and people go through innovation in terms of um, solving bigger problems and, um, you know, having support of the local communities. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, I think uh, on this, uh, there are <clears throat> certainly many similarities across different uh, ecosystems across multiple countries, ASEAN, India, and actually beyond. Uh, now, I would like to start uh, our second round of question with uh, Mudit. Uh, and I would like to ask Mudit uh, to share with us some of the learnings from the government uh, when it comes to supporting incubators in India. I know that it can look like the million dollar question, but what works and what doesn't? Right. So I'll start the answer by saying that this is still something that we are learning. Chintan Vaishnav's team at AIM is still working on programs around this and how to assess incubators. But from my time running programs, two or three things stand out to me. Um, of course, and, and the programs I'm thinking about is where there's some kind of a grant, whether it's government or some uh, philanthropy or corporate giving a grant to some institute to run an incubator. And it, it can be institute, it could be an industry association, so on. So that's the mental model I have in mind. Um, what works is when there is a very strong alignment of the host, whether it is the industry association or the university, that this is something which will not only set us apart from our competitors, but also create a new generation of entrepreneurs and businesses in the country or in their area. So that kind of intent, that kind of alignment with the bigger objective is very important. And no amount of guidance or incentives can ever replicate or replace intent, good intent, or the, the intrinsic motivation to do this. That said, there is, I believe, three things which are very important for 
funding us in, uh, um, agencies to uh, um, look at when they are supporting incubators, which is of course capital. So you need to have four to five years of running expenses for an incubator to be able to identify its niche, to be able to identify its business model, its, its uh, procedures for helping startups and to identify how it will become sustainable over the longer term. So capital is very important. The second thing is connections. I believe the most important thing that an incubator does is to connect the entrepreneurs, the founders to the right people, whether it is buyers, whether it is vendors of um, raw material, it, whether it is consultants who can provide specific advice. So those kinds of connections can only come when the incubator manager or the incubator CEO himself or herself is extremely well connected in that re regional ecosystem, in that city or in that region. The third thing, of course, is the capabilities. A, a good incubator should be helping a startup identify what its drawbacks, what its shortcomings are, and to be able to fill in those shortcomings. There might be some very good tech background founders who don't have HR experience. There might be some very good design startups which don't have legal experience and any kind of combination combination. I can pick up any number of examples on this. So it is very important for the incubator to be able to get, deliver those capabilities and those, and it's not easy to teach something which you don't know yourself. So that's why incubators need to have those capabilities and to be able to deliver, uh, to, to train a startup on how to fill those shortcomings, whether it is in HR, whether it is in taxation, compliance, whether it is in hiring new people, very often the, the IT systems that they're using. So those capabilities have to be built in the incubator before they can be transferred to their startups. The connections have to be deep and wide across the region because only then can a startup be, get the right advice and the right um, ability to grow. And of course, capital. So the incubator can focus on helping the startups in the region before looking at its own financial viability. So five to six years of capital. So the capital connections and capabilities will be the framework I use. Thank you very much, Mudit. Uh, now I would like to go back to uh, Michelle uh, again now uh, to ask you also uh, something about incubator and accelerator services. Uh, so which, which one of these services were key to you in the development of uh, your business? And what can you share in terms of uh, success factors? Thank you, Gilia. I think we pro we also agree with Mudit. I think even in this part of the world, um, definitely you would need to cover on some of the capabilities, um, knowledge on um, in terms of uh, incorporation, setting up your company, the legal considerations, um, how to set up your tech teams. I think um, going through all this is important for an incubator and also providing um, business development and market access types of services would be important as well. So I think that is something that we see uh, for, for incubator services in the past. And we do see that um, typically an uh, incubator will look something like a three to four months program with a group of selected founders and companies. Then they are based in a co-working space and they are put through like um, different seminars, networking sessions to help them uh, really set up their business properly and also raise venture capital funding. I think um, that is a raising venture capital uh, fund, funding is probably one of the one of the success metrics that incubators um, do um, measure uh, the incubator by. And I would think that if they are able to help them uh, scale beyond the country, one country, that is also an indicator of success because there's traction, I would say it's uh, a traction metric that we can track. So uh, typically for this kind of incubator service, you would see um, pre-seed or seed funding raised from venture capital themselves, or sometimes uh, together with some angel investors. So uh, this would help them build the fundamentals of, of the company right at the start, at the very early stage. And um, I think I think um, it's something that Southeast Asia is pretty familiar with. Um, I think be it Singapore, Indonesia, or even Philippines, I think for incubator services, that is uh, what we see in Southeast Asia. But because of COVID-19, it has uh, turned a little bit 
different. So um, within the past year um, now to now, and also like maybe projecting a little bit further into the future, we probably would see that um, incubators would uh, have this virtual transition. So um, most incubators would develop a hybrid model or fully virtual. For Quest ourselves, we have been running our programs 90% virtual. So like um, most of the things uh, you, you see us running, um, if, if you are updated uh, to what are some of the activities that Quest Ventures has been doing, um, it's mainly virtual. So like um, our regional partners, global partners do join us um, for this kind of sessions through just one click away. So I would say that this trend is here to stay and um, most incubators will become virtual and global in nature. And this virtual nature will actually encourage on-demand access to um, knowledge, resources, mentorship, and it will be more customized, I would say, to drive the startup success. It's something that we're adopting into our programs as well, because if we run programs um, every quarter, we don't expect um, a lot of things to change um, within each quarter. So a lot of our webinars are, are kind of on demand basis, but during the program itself, we do bring experts down for interactive Q&A and discussion. So it's more intimate, it's more cozy and interactive. So I think that's something that we do see um, in terms of incubators going um, into a virtual mode and encouraging more customized kind of experience to drive startup success. And there's a, probably going to be on-demand uh, access to resources as well. It's something that we are moving towards, I could say, I could say that. And because everything is virtual and we don't need to travel, then you would see that the access um, to our networks is a global one. You don't need to travel down to the different countries to meet the different mentors and you would be able to find out whether your product would have a product market fit or even a chance in the market itself. So I think um, that that being said, we do see that this trend is here to stay and um, probably uh, you're just one click away from your global consumers, partners and even investors. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, now, back to India with Chintan Bakshi. What are some of the key roles that incubators play in the startup ecosystem in India? And how do you think this differs from uh, other global counterparts? Uh, over to you. Thanks, Julia. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, at a, at a general level, I think incubators in India uh, may not be too different than uh, incubators across the world. I mean, I guess one one difference that I can immediately think of is the fact that India is a, is a fairly large country and, uh, you know, at one end you'll have a Bangalore, which is competing with the Silicon Valleys of the world. Uh, I mean, the, the top ecosystems, but at the other end, uh, and you know what, what Chintan Rashna also talked about, broad basing, you know, we'll have uh, rural areas and we'll have some regions which are, which are very, very underdeveloped in general and also as far as the startup incubation is concerned. So, so therefore, what I'm really trying to say is that the that the that the unique roles that that you may see incubators playing in India is, I think, more of a function of the diverse diversity of of ecosystems, right? So, if there's a there's a there's a incubator in Bangalore or Delhi, it needs to it needs to play a very different role as compared to an incubator which is let's say based in the northeast. Uh, we are doing actually a program in Assam, uh, you know. So there. I would say incubators, a lot of incubators may even be doing evangelizing entrepreneurship, right? They're they are even sort of uh, developing awareness of what, what are the challenges of becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, they may be doing some very early training programs. So it's more like, a, like an awareness generation uh, program and, and training program. But if you, if you look at an incubator, which is in a more mature ecosystem, you know, some of the incubators may almost be looking like early stage uh, seed funds, right? I mean, a lot of incubators in India actually also do funding. So that, that's the good part because uh, I think the government and, and all of these uh, organizations, government organizations just supporting incubators, even CSRs have realized that funding is, is one of the key pieces because, uh, you know, uh, before the commercial funds can come in, uh, a startup may need funds for validation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of investors, especially the slightly later stage venture capital investors may not invest 
or may not take the kind of risks that a lot of startups, especially in the agri and some of these emerging spaces may need to take. I mean, they may need to do multiple healthcare, et cetera. These are some of the areas where you may need to do a few more pilots and validations before uh, it is de-risked enough. So a lot of incubators may even be playing the role of, a, of, a, of an early stage seed fund. And uh, in fact, we also do it. So some of our team members are professionals from the VC industry also. So it's, it's an entire spectrum. At one end, you'll have incubators which are promoting entrepreneurship and, and kind of going amongst youth and uh, helping them ideate, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, you'll of course have the, the conventional physical incubators where, uh, where people can take up space, can, can have access to labs. You know, so that's, I would say, the, the, the conventional model uh, of incubation, right? Typically, it's a space where startups can be based out of and they can build their products. Uh, so that is I would say one of the pieces, but it's kind of integrated both backward as well as forward. Backward towards doing training sessions, educational programs, awareness generation, uh, et cetera, and, and forward towards doing maybe acceleration programs. So a lot of incubators, including ours, we, we, we do a lot of accelerator programs. Of course, you know our focus is to do accelerator programs in, in domains which are still uh, sort of upcoming, right? I mean, because you know, a lot of commercial corporate accelerators will be happening in domains which are more mature as far as startup activity is concerned. So for example, we used to do an accelerator called IE Accelerator back in 2008, which was focused on consumer internet because consumer internet that at that point of time was just evolving. But now you have uh, many seed funds and angel networks, uh, venture capital companies doing accelerators in the internet space. So there's no need for an incubator like us to do. So in a way, we are also market making. A lot of incubators are also uh, doing accelerators, seed funds in domains where commercial capital may not be uh, readily accessible. They're sort of bridging that gap, uh, doing the role of a market maker. And maybe after five, 10 years in that sector, uh, you know, the, uh, the market forces come in and you have the uh, commercial investors, corporates, et cetera, doing accelerators. So yeah, I mean, right from education to almost uh, like a VC. And, you know, I think the important distinction to be made here is that it's very regional, uh, you know, given the, the wide disparity in, in ecosystems that you will see in a country like India. Thank, Thank you. you, Chintan. I think Mudit wants to quickly add a point on deep tech. So do it now before we yes. go back to Mel and so, the other Chintan. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got a ladder. Mudit, I think we lost Mudit. So maybe we will get back to his point later. And now let's continue this round of question uh, with the Philippines and Mel. And I would ask Mel to highlight a little bit her experience as an entrepreneur with accelerator and incubator programs. Over yeah. to you, Mel. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, I personally believe in um, incubators and accelerators. I have been in two myself. And in fact, uh, some people in the audience here uh, like are, are part of the technology business incubators, which is um, spearheaded by the government, right? So um, I've been uh, in two accelerators. Uh, one is Idea Space Philippines, which is an accelerator in the Philippines, um, honing and uh, really um, uh, uh, helping uh, ideas, uh, idea face uh, startups to grow their idea and grow their business. And then the second um, in, uh, accelerator we've, we've gone, gone through as a company is um, uh, Iterative VC. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an, a, an accelerator based in Singapore um, uh, run by two um, former YC founders uh, who have made their exits in their own space. So uh, they've, they've sold their companies to eBay. Uh, one has a currently has a billion dollar startup in, in the US, right? And, and that's sort of uh, where we are right now. Um, and of course, uh, in the Philippines, there are technology business incubators where um, around the Philippines, you have a lot of um, incubators trying to foster um, ideas from the provinces such as Visayas, uh, like uh, Aklan, uh, Davao, um, and parts of parts of the Philippines, right? But um, for us, really, when we enter uh, into an accelerator or incubator, um, you know, the idea here is we need to be able to accelerate our growth. We need to be able to be better from where we first 
used to be, right? And um, you know, uh, that's sort of what we choose when we we enter accelerators, right? Uh, it's it has to be growth, uh, not just in revenue but in users, right? Um, improvement in our unit economics, right? We have to be able to somehow be able to get uh, um, our our unit ac or ac acquisition costs much lower. Right or our operation costs much lower than what they used to be, and um, lastly would be um, you know uh, network growth in network right. So we need to be able to say uh, acquire more customers or partner with more um, players, um, you know, in the space in order for us to really make sure that we are able to grow the business further. Um, that's sort of what we have been doing, um, and that's sort of why. Uh, I, accelerators really play a significant part in the Philippine uh, Philippine ecosystem, especially because there's not a lot of um, uh, funders or not there's not a lot of funding coming in. Again, because we don't, I mean, by way of uh, um, opportunity, right? We currently are still getting to um, uh, getting to our first unicorn, right? Or, or finding that first unicorn. So accelerators have been very uh, useful and and sustain uh, help helpful in terms of getting uh, startups to be more sustainable and, 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 and growing at a phase where, um, you know, you don't need much funding. And so uh, I guess that's sort of where we are. Um, and yeah, it, it's something that we truly personally believe in, uh, because especially because, yeah, there's not a lot of funding and we really need to get Philippine startups to be more sustainable than funded. Thank you, Mel. I think now Mudit is back. Uh, if you are with us and you want to share your point on deep tech, maybe we can do it now, would it? Yes, my apologies. I had problems on the connection. So the, uh, the point that Chintan was making was that the market moved a lot. And now what I'm seeing in India is a lot of the startup incubators are actually moving towards companies which, are, which have a deep tech focus. Um, whether it is applications in agriculture, health, uh, information technology, or it is based on very high advanced technologies. We saw some vaccines come out of India, we, and we saw the first test for COVID came, come out of a startup in India. So that evolution has moved from internet uh, connection, uh, companies or ma digital marketplaces to... I think we lost probably Mudit again. So let's continue. Ah oh, no, he's back. Mudit, we can't hear you. So we'll probably go and continue with the, the question for the other Chintan, and then we will get back to you later. So now uh, to conclude this second round with Chintan Vaishnav, uh, to what extent do you observe a synergy between academia and policy when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship in the ecosystem in India? And what could you suggest? Are there any immediate major changes to, let's say, better link these two sectors? Over to you. Um, that's a very good question. It's a very hard question. I, um, so, so what I see is... Um, um, what I see so far, I would classify it as uh, transactions, not synergy. Um, so this is, you know, here's a program I'm giving you X, why don't you do Y? Uh, and you might say, well, if you keep doing enough of these transactions, <clears throat> there will be synergy, right? Um, uh, one could argue that that's the sort of a theory of change here. But I, I so far see that uh, there's a, you know, there are programs that get launched, competitions that get launched, people get, uh, you know, money to do an early stage up to seed, I mean, seed funds, sometimes what has semblance of a series A. But, but it's all uh, fairly, um, uh, in some pockets, it is more uh, mature. For instance, Department of Science and Technology, um, uh, Chintan had mentioned, um, um, there is Department of Biotechnology. Where the incubators uh, are more mature, there is some form of a, a frontier moving forward, if you would, uh, collectively. 
uh, whether it was strategized that way or not, uh, uh, some conversations are making it that way. Uh, but I think what, what I see uh, in terms of sort of what is, so, so what will it take to take us to a synergy, right? Where, where the energies of these two are sort of cumulatively uh, adding up. Uh, I, I feel, and I, I'm really in, in, sometimes quite perturbed by uh, this uh, fact that uh, I think the barrier may be psychological uh, in the sense that if you look at an academic community on one side, uh, a, a business community on the other side, a government community on the third side, uh, they're, they're, um, their, their trust in each other is not where it ought to be, I feel, uh, so far, you know. For instance, if you take the business community and an academic community, in fact, you can go back in our culture to really old proverbs where one community is aiming a jibe at another community because it just feels like, you know, oh, those guys over there, they don't know how real life, real world works. That's what the business community may feel. The academic community may say, oh, those guys over there, they only care about money. They don't really care about the intellectual stuff, all of that. So there's this really deep divide that uh, we really uh, have to overcome somehow. Uh, and and in, I mean, from my perspective, I can say, I mean, COVID-19, second wave recently, I could see many problems where uh, a business, com uh, an academic community has a solution, but has no acumen to take it to the market. A business community has acumen to take it to the market, but no solution. These two, if they can come together, similarly for the government, we know the problem. What is the nation's problem? But we don't. We 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 have to bring these people together. I don't see that happening yet. Thank you very much. This is an issue I've been working for a very very long time, and there's also the problem of different incentives, you know, uh, within people in different communities, which sometimes make it very difficult, you know, to try to collaborate and work together. But anyway, we could spend hours to discuss these issues. Now it's time to. Uh, go ahead with our third round of questions before a short Q&A session. And I would like, we were, go we're going to talk a little bit about public policy now. And I would like to start with the Chintan Bakshi. So what support do the incubators need from policymakers? Uh, over to you, Chintan. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, if, if I again talk from the context in India, uh, I think we have discussed it uh, in, in great detail that there, there is already quite a lot of policy support that is available to incubators. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, there are quite a few state governments now that have that have become significantly active, uh, right? I mean, uh, in varying degrees, some are, some are more active than the others. Uh, so at a, at a broad level, I think, uh, there's there's quite a lot of support available, but obviously, uh, I mean, a lot of things can be done, and there are a couple of things uh, which sort of come to mind. And it's really now I'm talking from the context in which we are, right? We are now talking about in India of a of a fairly mature incubator ecosystem, uh, or, or you know, uh, even if it's not very mature, but it's kind of getting there. So I think on the policy front, uh, there is probably a need to now start connecting the dots. And, and perhaps that's what uh, Chintan was also uh, uh, kind of alluding to. Uh, so for example, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that through the means of an example. Uh, you know, there may be some sectors and, you know, I'll take a, a sector in, in the state in which uh, we operate uh, largely, which is Rajasthan. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a less industrialized state the state, but very, very rich in, uh, in, in heritage, tourism, crafts, et cetera, right? And we have had enough evidence of startups which have tried to marry technology along with, with crafts, right? I mean, there are a few examples. In fact, there's a company called Jaipur Rux, which uh, has been covered uh, fairly well, which, which has close to 40,000 viewers, artisans that it impacts. And it, it's a fairly successful company. It, it delivers, it, it sells their they make rugs, uh, it sells rugs across the world. And they have a very nicely integrated technology backend. I mean, it's not a startup, uh, but what I'm really trying to say is that there are enough examples of businesses which have taken, because, you know, a company like Jaipur Rugs would have come into existence in maybe the uh, 
1990s and they took about 20 years to build. But now, uh, in the era in which we are, where technology is available, where entrepreneurial energies are there, incubators are there, etc., you know, there probably needs to, the point I'm really trying to make is that the policy support now needs to be uh, in terms of trying to look at sectors and then trying to see what, what are the gaps in, in, the, in, in, in particular sectors, right? So what are the kind of gaps if we have to build the ecosystem of startups and startup-like organizations uh, in, let's say, the craft sector, which will be very different than agri, which will be very different than biotech, maybe in the tourism sector, maybe in the heritage conservation sector, maybe in whatever food. I mean, there can be various uh, industries or sectors which will all of them may need a different intervention. And perhaps that's that's also the point which Chintan was trying to mention that, you know, maybe we, which is probably the reason why you have eight organizations which are trying to do stuff and perhaps one like an Atul Innovation Mission, which is, which is more horizontal, uh, uh, right? So I think, you know, what I'm really alluding to is that while I think the 1.0, 2.0 policy support, whether it's in terms of funding, uh, for five years to, to enable an incubation center to become sustainable, availability of space, availability of funds which can be given to, to startups, you know, more, more funds from CSR. So, you know, lately, I think a couple of years back, there was a notification that uh, CSR funds given to incubators can be, uh, can be considered as valid CSR fund, CSR spend. So a lot of stuff has happened at a, at a broad level to help build the incubator ecosystem. I think now we need to start looking more vertically, start looking more sectorally, and then try to uh, see what needs to be done to bring in policy support to integrate innovation and startup in the more traditional uh, sectoral sectors. And you know that that's the point I was trying to make through the example that I gave. That in a in a sector like crafts, maybe there is uh, there are there is there are some design interventions, there are some technology interventions which are required. Uh, so maybe, you know, there may be some incubators which are essentially working on upgrading technology, uh, which artisans, et cetera, use. I mean, I'm just giving an example. They could be, they could be incubators which are just focusing on design. I mean, they are, they are sort of uh, creating a platforms or programs through which, uh, you know, the makers have a better sense of what, what they should be making. So, you know, these kind of things. So we may need to have policies which are focused on enabling uh, startup ecosystems to get built in such sectors. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the one important point I wanted to make. I mean, there may be some smaller interventions here and there, but I think this is probably more significant in my, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, let's go to take the point of view of Mel in the Philippines. So. What do you think governments can do better to support entrepreneurs in a sense like you are to start up and also scale up? Over to you, Mel. Okay, so well, for, for us, it's really about, um, you know, of course, the government is currently giving incentives, right? It's one, one way to encourage startups, you know, or people that want to invest in the Philippines to invest. However, um, you know, uh, I feel like, you know, the whole uh, ecosystem needs a lot of support, uh, beginning with the schools, right? In the Philippines, um, you know, we are not like the Chinese where if you have a business, your family will be happy. Um, you know, uh, in the Philippines, when you study, you are normally groomed to enter, say, uh, a large corporation, right? And and that mindset has to change. It's been changing. Um, people have been working on efforts to make it work where people um, make entrepreneurship more sexy or, you know, or, or more people are encouraged for entrepreneurship. But a lot of it has to still be done on the school level to encourage entrepreneurship. Part of the reason why people don't want to be entrepreneurs or to, to start startups is because of the risk, right? You don't, again, uh, in, in, in our, our, our part of the in our part of Southeast Asia, we don't have a lot of funding, right? So any wrong move you make uh, is 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 almost detrimental for your startup. And so this brings us to the to the next part where government should put in uh, government should uh, come 
where to partner with startups in order for uh, in order for startups to thrive in order for startups to get um get more money right so you do, m- money or funding comes in both ways it can come from an investor perspective but for um you know startups in the philippines that don't have uh, ne- don't, don't necessarily have a lot of investors what is important is traction right and in order to get traction um you know government could play a, play a role so for example in our case when we were proposing that we uh, become Become a, you know, we wanted to become a one-stop solution for um, small and medium businesses to export. Um, government was one of our customers. It, we started off by becoming a, you know, becoming a consultant and um, uh, making the export guidebook. That was how we got about ten thousand dollars, and that was how we funded our company at, at the very start, right? Um, I, but uh, you know, over the years, we've also partnered with government uh, to help more small and medium businesses export. So they've been giving us customers, right, who would avail of our services, and in turn, um, th- that money from revenues, were, which we were able to use to grow the business, and and survive, um, you know, even COVID nineteen. So. Um, uh, Government plays a role in terms, of course, education, uh, in terms of incentivizing uh, and, and providing some level of funding, but also, you know, hopefully government partners with more startups, uh, which will allow startups to generate more revenue and help startups uh, in, in developing countries like ours become more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, now, uh, let's discuss also a little bit about the current context that is the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, let's start uh, with the Chintan Baishna. Uh, are there any sectors that have taken a higher priority for support in light of the pandemic? And could you name a few of the sectors that have a higher potential for scalable solutions? Over to you, Chintan. Okay, well, the first, it sounds like the first part of your question is Uh, empirical. So I could just tell you what my observations are. Uh, The second part of your question is more predictive. So I'll give you some hypothesis. Is that okay? Um, So so I think uh, which sectors have uh, attracted more attention? Uh, I, I think one of the things that the pandemic did for good or bad uh, was um, it really sent us uh, to sectors that were, you know, back to basics. Um, it, it sent us, it, it made us think about health, education, livelihood, at least in the Indian context, I could name these three. And uh, uh, it told us that unless you fix these three, uh, you can't build very tall towers on top of it. So I think those are the three uh, sectors that have achieved, that that have uh, received more attention. Um, what are the sectors going forward? Um, uh, I, I would uh, again. This is where the uh, these are my hypotheses. Uh, so uh, take it with, and, and they're not research. So take it with as large a grain of salt as you can afford. Um, right. So. Uh, I feel that there are maybe three trends that are worth um, thinking about. One is uh, um, some uh, form of uh, indigenization. Uh, Looks like I'm losing power. So uh, some form of indigenization. Um, uh, uh, What I saw with the pandemic as we were trying to take innovations to uh, uh, markets uh, to to fit, to solve problems during these surges was that technology after technology we will unpack the technology and we will reach a point where you will be left with one or two components that our nation did not make that was not a, in a normal time that wouldn't be a problem but in in the pandemic time the difficulty was the uh, the time delay in uh, fetching those components. So I wish, and then you go around and ask, do we not know how to make them? No, we do know how to make them. Do we not have equipment to make them? No, we do have equipment to make them. So so I hope we can focus on that uh, more. So that's one. Um, second, um, uh, there's going to be more decentralization, right? So decentralized solutions were definitely 
uh, uh, in uh, uh, demand. So that's something I, I would uh, offer, uh, we focus on. Uh, the third piece is, I think what we're going to, what's going to happen at least for some time, maybe going forward for quite a bit of time, is that we're going to be digitally more dense and physically more sparse. So any solutions that help us do that, I think would be good solutions in my mind. I mean, those are three hypotheses for you. Okay, so self, yeah. Thank you very much. We, we have, we have you know, now time to think about the hypotheses in the future, so some good food for thoughts. Uh, now, I will ask a similar question to Michelle uh, uh, in Singapore. So, you know, uh, in terms of your experience as an investor, what can you tell us about, you know, the last year and a half uh, sectors that have been particularly uh, innovative, others that have been particularly been affected by the pandemic? What can you share? Thank, thank you for the question. I think for Quest ourselves, we have been investing in this region for quite some time. And we do invest in early stage startups in the seed and series A stage. Um, there's a focus in digital economy for like the past 10 years because it allows us to capture the opportunities in Southeast Asia and emerging Asia. And with COVID-19, um, we do see great investment opportunities in the following sectors for our Asia Fund too. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Cloud Kitchens. Um, I think some of you might be familiar with um, the term ghost kitchens uh, or Cloud Kitchens. So this uh, global kitchen market actually was valued at your 43.1 billion in 2019, and it's estimated to reach um, 71.4 billion by 2027. So that's a kicker of 19% from 2020 to 2024. And we believe that the growth levers are the scalable business model, the increasing rate of food brand development, and also the post pandemic or in pandemic search in food delivery because I don't think we're still we're getting out of the pandemic as of yet. Um, so we believe that that would be one of the growth levers um, for Cloud Kitchen. And our Quest portfolio company in Indonesia, Yami Corp, is a Cloud Kitchen operator um, helping FMB brands scale their delivery business. So for um, for for this company, we invested in them last year and the number of meals that they sold in um, financial year 2020 uh, was 10x. So they sold like 10 times more after our investment. We went into this uh, investment deal together with SoftBank so that you might be um, familiar with one of the top venture capital in, in Asia as well, in the region globally, yeah. So um, that's for Club Kitchen. Another sector um, that we do see a great opportunity in would be the enterprise SaaS. So enterprise subscription as a service, just in case anyone might not be familiar with that. So um, the global spending on enterprise software is about 492 billion, and the KGR is 12% from 2018 to 2022. So this is accelerated by the pandemic because most enterprises would now prefer self-service subscription-based solutions instead of those um, managed services where um, you require high um, investments and resources put into to actually sell this software and solutions to the companies. So our Kazakhstan portfolio company, Clockster, is a cloud-based time and attendance solution with a biometric-based clock in device. So their analyzed revenue growth since um, our investment to them last year is about 200%. So that's very great numbers. And also for Malaysia, House, a blue collar uh, workforce management app for SMEs with um, automated reports for managers. Um, their year on year growth is 150% and there's 0% churn. So that's super great numbers for um, a SaaS company. And um, the, third, the third sector that we do see um, opportunities in um, before the pandemic and also during the pandemic would be uh, fintech. I think fintech is not new in the region and many Asian fintechs have thrived in the past five to 10 years in a very largely supportive ecosystem in Southeast Asia in this part of the world and also globally. So going cashless and serving the underbank and unbank has been something that uh, this part of the world is focusing on in the past two years, I would say. Then, according to Forbes, the underserved customers presents the next trillion dollar opportunity. And in, in Indonesia, we invested in Gaji Gesa, 
that's a fintech platform that provides unwitch access and financial management tools for employees in Indonesia and HR analytics for employees. So their monthly transaction grew more than five times in four months since the start of 2021. Very good numbers as well. And that's where the opportunities lie in this sector. And the last one that we do have um, would be vertical marketplaces. So marketplace is a no brainer because um, the pandemic makes everyone make their purchases online from grocery to clothes to new houses and properties. So there's higher consumer expectations for personalization. And this, are, this is following the emergence of more niche and consumer specific sites. According to uh, one of the reports, 35% of the consumer shop at niche marketplaces and the value added services from the marketplace offer brand and retailers value added services such as data sharing agreements, consumer product on consumer product price and trend analytics. So our portfolio, our portfolio in Singapore, MoveUs, is a digital marketplace for international relocation. And it's moving to become Southeast Asia's largest end-to-end -end relocation platform for global citizens. And it has, and its numbers of web users has uh, more than 20 times um, from 2019 to 2020. So I think this four uh, sectors that I've identified are opportunities that Quest Ventures have uh, seen during uh, the pandemic times and uh, I, I hope that it's something that uh, that you can chime in as well yeah back to you Gila. thank you thank you Michelle uh, so now before a few minutes of Q&A uh, back to uh, Mudit I hope he's back with us uh, I would like to ask you Mudit uh, what are and should be the focus area for upcoming policy intervention in light of the COVID-19 pandemic Right, thanks. Let me start by apologizing for the connection. I haven't had these issues in the last one year, but today is that day. So let me come to my point quickly before I get it again. Um, going uh, above points that Jintan mentioned, I think of course, health and health tech as a whole, which is broadening access, but also, as he said, put it very well that it will be digitally more dense and physically apart. Technologies which allow most urban and rural citizens to continue their activities, their productive activities without direct control will actually see a lot more investment. And that, I think the pandemic is the most globally shared experience we've had in several decades. And almost all innovators will have this at the back of their mind when they're identifying new solutions, new technologies. And policymakers will always also try and support those intentions. And it makes more sense because we don't know when the pandemic will end. As Michelle said, we are still in pandemic and not post pandemic as we would all like to be. And we would also be supporting technologies which are able to go beyond the traditional entrepreneurs and their markets. India has a major issue around digital divide. And in the policy world, there's a major conversation on now that so many hundreds and millions of people or ha are used to technologies or have been forced to adopt technology in some way, how can we use these new habits to improve whether it is governance, whether it is policy delivery? How do you use this opportunity to get new habits, new networks, new connections made, which can improve citizens' lives? We are already seeing a lot of people who are in big cities in, in India move to smaller cities, start their own enterprises. How do you help them connect to global markets? How do you maybe decentralize some knowledge based offices, IT based offices? And so those are things which will require more entrepreneurs to come up with ideas. And that is where the policy world is looking to engage. Um, two of my colleagues in my office are looking at how something as connected to the ground as agricultural technologies can be connected to advisors in other parts of the countries because now even farmers and traders are used to or, or have been exposed to using technologies. So these kinds of shifts, which are almost unprecedented and hopefully never repeated in our lives, will be used to create new habits. And for those habits, there will be policy support to new entrepreneurs who are bringing new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mudit. Uh, now we have 10 minutes left. So I would like to take uh, one of the questions we received on the chat box and ask it to all speakers. It's a very high level question, but I think it's connected to what uh, many of the speakers uh, were sharing uh, just now. That is basically, 
what should we do? I use we uh, plural uh, to support entrepreneurship to improve the world, to solve uh, global challenges. I think this is related to what Mudit has started addressing and because he has good internet connection right now, Mudit, let's start with you. Maybe just a couple of minutes because then we will need to close. Over to you. <laughs> so yes, uh, what the governments can do, what the policy world and think tanks and associations can do to help entrepreneurs make the world better. In my opinion, in countries like ours, starts with more engagement from the government and that engagement is more procurement. So new technologies, new products, new solutions that are coming in. Traditionally, all governments are used to buying through tenders or competitive processes, which are very important in democracies because of transparency, equity, and fair access. So how do we retain those principles of equity, transparency, and fair access, and able to identify and adopt technologies and solutions from startups is to me the most important thing that the government can do to not just support entrepreneurship, but also get the energy, get the benefits of technologies from startups, from innovators to the citizens. So simplifying and de-clogging the procurement pipeline, de-clogging the procurement systems to me is the most important thing. But that's one thing I'm sure my other co-panelists will have other ideas. Thank you. Now maybe let's go to Mel in the Philippines. What can you share very briefly with us? Um, I think what's important is to solve relevant problems, right? Uh, of course, you know, you have, you're, you can do go deep tech, uh, right? But if you're not solving a problem that is inherent and that is relevant during the time, say COVID-19, for example, it'll, it'll always be that the startups will fail, right? So the goal here is to encourage entrepreneurship, encourage more startups to change the world. And that, that will only happen if people focus on problems, right? And create uh, relevant solutions to those problems. Thank you, Matt. Very concise, uh, good answers. And um, now maybe let's continue the round. Shintan, uh, Shintan, are you with us? Which which Shintan is this? This, this is my Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Well, uh, sorry, I I, uh, I got interrupted, so I didn't hear your question. Could you please repeat that? Yeah, it's, it's a kind of the million dollar question because someone from the chat box was asking, what can we do actually to support entrepreneurship for a better world? Be before? For a better world. For a better world, I see. <laughs> I think uh, if I were to do one thing, I would... Uh, um, I would take every entrepreneur and uh, uh, make them live with their intended end user for a month so that they can empathize better. That's, that's a very good suggestion, which often, you know, many people in uh, uh, entrepreneurship classes give, you know, get to know your customers. This is, you know, the first lesson that you should learn if you want to become an entrepreneur. Uh, so thank you very much. Now let's continue perhaps with Michelle. Michelle, what can you share with us? Thanks. I think I, I totally agree with all the other speakers. And I believe that um, to help entrepreneurs actually takes a lot of different stakeholders to, to work together from, from the government on the policy side of things, from the venture capital um, that's putting in money to bring the future uh, to the present. Um, I think that's something that's uh, important as well. And also the different um, corporates and also incubators, accelerators to help open up networks um, and also doors for them, to, doors of opportunities for them to grow. It's also something that uh, would be very important to help this uh, entrepreneurs grow uh, their business. And I think of maybe taking a leap from what Singapore is doing, um, having like a, a whole network um, and also a safety net, I would say. So for those uh, founders who maybe fail in their business, they could uh, perhaps work in the venture capital to do another business, to build another venture, or they can work with um, the corporate innovation teams in a corporate that they, they used to work with. I think that is a safety net that we're looking at. Um, maybe maybe uh, that, that is something uh, more specific to Singapore, but definitely would help to encourage more first-time founders or serial entrepreneurs. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. And now before we close, uh, uh, let's hear from Chintan Bakshi. Uh, 
your turn now. Yeah. No, so my, if, if I were to do one thing, uh, you know, my suggestion would actually be a combination of what Melissa and, and Chintan mentioned. Uh, so yeah, I, I also agree that, you know, some, somewhere uh, entrepreneurs need to, to come closer to, to, to the customer. They need to be solving problems. But the way I would like to do it is by bringing the tools and technologies and the startup ecosystem and the tools and technologies of entrepreneurship to uh, to entrepreneurs in tier two, tier three cities, right? And, and these are the ones who are, I think, most in touch with a lot of the problems which need to be solved. Uh, so if we can, and you know, over the last few years, last couple of decades, I think there's been a lot of learning, a lot of frameworks, technologies, tools, et cetera, of how to bring a product to market, how to convert an idea into a business. I mean, those things have, have sort of got uh, formalized. In fact, we have learned a lot and now we have started creating processes to, to try and bring that into our program. So if those could be brought to entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs in these uh, tier two, tier three cities, they are already in touch with a lot of problems. They are probably the best folks to be solving some of these social challenges through uh, social innovation, social enterprises, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are running out of time. So uh, we are about to close. I, I would like to thank once again, all participants for, you know, staying connected with us until the very end. All speakers for their excellent remarks. I think you gave us lots of ideas. Now we need to digest them and think about them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, some food for thoughts, as I was saying before. So many, many thanks to Moody, to Melissa, Michelle, and the two Chintans. And then please uh, stay tuned because in a few weeks time, you will receive uh, some information on the second of our uh, area, ciie.co dialogues. So, Stay connected and uh, we hope to welcome you again soon uh, at uh, one of our online events. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.